Good morning, everyone. Um, I welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Tammy Akintelebo. I am the perinatal and uh, I'm the coordinator of the perinatal and infant health program has, at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis people. Uh, the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute is a provincial organization, um, a nonprofit provincial organization with a mission to reduce uh, the occurrence of disabling conditions in children by providing evidence-based information to Saskatchewan healthcare providers, service providers, families, as well as communities. Our goal is healthy children. We do this through uh, primary prevention methods by way of training, development of resources, and providing information um, according to current best evidence. We believe that all children, regardless of their ability, have the right uh, to the best physical, social, and emotional health possible. We work in a variety of ways uh, on different topic areas, including perinatal and infant health, uh, as well as sexual and reproductive health, um, FASD prevention, um, early childhood mental health, child injury prevention, child traffic safety, as well as um, parenting. The goal of the perinatal and infant health uh, program which is the one I coordinate, is to increase awareness on emerging and re-emerging health issues in the province here in Saskatchewan, relating to preconception health, pregnancy, as well as postnatal health. <clears throat> so we also cover aspects of um, early infant health, uh, including topics such as safe inf infant sleep and sudden infant death syndrome, like we will be discussing here today. And our role will be to provide evidence-based information on topics like this so that health and allied health care providers can better support their clients and so that parents and families can make informed decisions throughout their pregnancy, throughout delivery, as well as during their child's infancy. So our speaker today is Dr. James McKenna. I'll just give a brief bio uh, of him before he comes up. Dr. McKenna is a world-renowned expert in infant sleep. Uh, in particular, mother infant co-sleeping in relationship to breastfeeding and sudden infant death syndrome, which is SEEDS. He pioneered the first behavioral and um, electrophysiological studies documenting differences between mothers and infants sleeping together and apart. And he has become known worldwide for his work in promoting studies of breastfeeding and mother infant co-sleeping. He is a biological anthropologist and the director of the Mother Baby Behavioral Sleep Laboratory in uh, University of Notre Dame. Dr. McKenna has published over 150 articles and six books, including uh, the popular parenting book, Sleeping with Your Baby, A Parent's Guide to Co-Sleeping, and more recently, Safe Infant Sleep, Expert Answers to Your Co-Sleeping Questions. In the United States, um, my, Dr. McKenna remains a primary spokesperson to the media on issues pertaining to infant parental, parental sleeping arrangements, nighttime breastfeeding, and seeds prevention. He's the recipient of the prestigious Shannon Award from the National Institutes of Child Health and Development for his research on seeds, as well as the recipient of the Anthropology in the Media Award from the American Anthropological Association. So please um, welcome with me Dr. McKenna as he takes us to uh, today's um, session. Good morning, everyone, or at least it's early here. I'm just terribly privileged um, to have this career, to have been able to study mothers and babies. It was quite a surprise to me as I began studying the ecology of uh, social behavior of infancy among monkeys and apes and learned when I was about to have our own child and did, wow, uh, there's a lot of information here that kind of conflicts with how our culture has come to recommend what they consider the best kind of care for mothers and babies as regarding both feeding and sleeping arrangements. So the challenge of this particular lecture and all my lectures these days is how do you combine or integrate and make sense of 30 years of research that I've been doing this, pardon my revelation of my age, but nonetheless, here I am. But I hope that you will uh, forgive me for going so quickly and for putting a lot of information on slides. I thought of you after the lecture, 
I feel my purpose here is to get you interested, to introduce you to these new anthropological concepts and in relationship to uh, promoting uh, optimal maternal and infant and childhood health which I know all of you are greatly interested in and are on the front lines. Um, seeing all of this research and everybody's research on mothers and babies translated into real life. So I applaud your incredible efforts that permit people like myself to be able to actually explore this um, kind of divorced from the context within which it will prove applicable. So I'm going to go fast. Um, I will be honest if I don't quite finish, but you will have access to all the articles on which the material I discuss today and present to you is based. And it's all refereed material. The articles are there for your downloading. Um, and uh, actually this lecture on black and white um, miniature slides, you probably have seen that as a PDF and you're welcome to have that. So, pretty much everything you're gonna to see today, you will have access to. So I think that's one reason I feel justified. I can move a little bit faster. So I'm gonna begin right away um, and kind of I front loaded some of the take home messages and then I'll provide you all the details about what led me to these take home top list messages, et cetera, as we move along. So Temi's gonna handle my progression through here. So Temi, would you present the first slide, please? All right, so here it is. This is gonna be your kind of take home messages which I'll have the responsibility to fill in. I know that some of you are not as familiar with the sort of technicalities of co-sleeping and have you know, uh, preconceived notions about what it is. And I hope that you will uh, integrate that with some of the uh, insights I hope to provide you with today. So here is sort of the kind of conclusive um, take home messages that will be filled in later first. Co-sleeping behavior in whatever diverse form it takes, mothers and infants within arm's reach of each other, is not surprising, unexpected, nor irresponsible, nor child abuse, nor neglect. It is absolutely not immoral. It is not inherently stupid or ignorant or parental behavior. It is the universal normative human behavior um, as we look around the globe today and throughout hundreds of thousands of years of our human development and evolution. Secondly, sweeping public health recommendations, whatever they are, must resonate emotionally and socially with the constituencies for whom they are intended. And thus far, anti-co-sleeping messages do not work. And I hope by the end of the hour and a half or whatever I've got here with you, that you will know exactly why. Um, this is not the recommendation, simply never bed share with your baby, do not resonate. And as you'll see, the statistics showing that overwhelmingly, at least in my country, and I presume perhaps in your own, that most mothers that particularly breastfeed are sleeping in bed with their babies and why they're disregarding simplistic recommendations against it. Where infant sleep is often unplanned, very fluid. Most babies sleep in more than one context, not exclusively social, not exclusively solitary. So health brochures and recommendations need to capture what happens when babies move between these solitary and social environments. It's critical. Co-sleeping is biologically interdependent with breastfeeding and is associated with the underlying parental biology that motivates it. And I will show you what I mean by that. And I've coined a term called breast sleeping that I will elaborate on that shows the absolute inseparability of all of the variables we look at with respect to what constitutes normal infant sleep, normal infant breastfeeding, normal maternal biology, normal breastfeeding patterns. All of that is integrated into one singular evolved behavioral and physiological system that I hope to actually be more explicit on and show you what that means. Point five is simply co-sleeping is incredibly diverse. It's as diverse as are the cultures doing it. There's a difference as well between the act of co-sleeping and the conditions within, it, within which it takes place, which as is true for most things we do in life can be either safe or unsafe. Next slide, Tammy. Co-sleeping is not a SIDS risk factor in the same way that other risk factors are like prone to sleep. Why? Because co-sleeping is not one discrete variable. Co-sleeping is heterogeneous. 
um, it's composed of a lot of different behaviors and a lot of different physiological engagements and interactions. Um, it, as a concept, lacks consent, consensus and thus, um, in a sense, is kind of an incoherent um, concept. And I hope to elaborate on that. But do keep in mind that it is whatever else you want to think biologically appropriate. For both moral and ethical reasons, parents, not medical authorities, must remain the final arbiters of their infant's nighttime needs and sleeping arrangements. Where babies sleep is not ultimately a medical issue at all, um, but instead is relational. It can be practical, it can be philosophical, it can be economic, and it can be determined by simply feeding method. No one size must fit and can fit um, and can work as a strategy here in terms of what we talk to families about. There is more than one way to save babies' lives and promote the well being of families depending on their particular circumstances. And I'm certain you're totally aware of this already. The early consolidation of infant sleep, which is pushed in our societies, is a very recent socio cultural construct um, associated only with bottle feeding cultures in industrialized societies and has little to do with what's in the infant's best interest. Indeed, such emphasis on consolidation as early in life of baby sleeping deeply in an, in an uninterrupted way actually threatens the best interests of infants psychologically and physically to be elaborated on later. According to Sackett, father of evidence-based medicine, which I'm about to introduce you to, in the form of public health recommendations, whatever they may be, must meet the needs, desires, and possibilities of those for whom the recommendations are intended. They have to make sense in the context in which they are to find acceptance or to be ignored. Tammy, next slide. I'm gonna introduce you to evidence-based medicine because it's a concept that everybody uses, including myself for a while, and never actually knew what it was. You'll be proud to know that Dr. David Sackett, given the title role of father of evidence-based medicine, actually is a Canadian come American. Uh, he was the founder of the first department at McMaster's University in Ontario, Ontario in clinical epidemiology, later became the directors, pardon my misspelling there, of the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine at the prestigious uh, Oxford University. Next slide. So what is this evidence-based medicine? I was surprised myself to learn, I have to admit, it begins with respect for patient values. And it's critical, he argues, to any adherent to general sweeping public recommendations. This is, uh, the reason I tell you this is that most recommendations that are sweeping have never followed the principles that I'm about to elicit here for you. Never move from epidemiological studies to sweeping public health recommendations before first generating hypotheses to test the ways in which the statistics in those epidemiological studies cluster. And in this case, with respect to sleeping, it has to do why in these studies do we find that some groups actually benefit and co-sleeping in the form of breast sleeping is beneficial and where there is not breastfeeding um, and on other subgroups in epidemiological studies bed sharing turns out to be a significant risk factor. And this would be the exact episode by which many investigators study what is causing those differences within the ep epidemiological studies before they are brought to a singular um, set of recommendations. And this has been um, really not followed in all of the medical recommendations about bed sharing that I know of. <clears throat> Part of evidence medicine is to rely on clinical exceptions to the generalities. Um, it's going back to that issue. There's no one size is going to fit all. Another principle that has been violated in the way in which bed sharing has been handled basically is to seek consensus among diverse scientists representing different lines of research from different fields. If it's one thing I've learned in my 30 years is no one field is going to be able to handle all of the complexities involved in where babies end up sleeping. Seems like it should be a no-brainer, but as it turns out, it isn't. And use all the lines of evidence that are possibly available in making public health recommendations. 
And in my own country, it's only been a group of 11 people, all trained medically and not in the evolutionary sciences, the social sciences, the developmental sciences, um, or even developmental psychology. And next slide, please. I want to read to you what your uh, fellow countryman um, has said about evidence medicine. But first, I want to point out that first bullet there that says, don't ever forget that evidence is not a neutral concept. The production of evidence is, of course, a human activity, and it's politically laden with various groups standing to gain or lose from the adaptation of their particular take on evidence. And that was by Homer and Broom that made this statement in a book about evidence medicine. But it reminds all of us that we're all tend toward confirmation bias, it's called, of the things we want to be true. And I don't think uh, it's wrong of me to say that in this very emotional uh, debate, or which should have been a discourse, no, not a debate, a bed sharing, that certainly there's very little evidence that discussions research on bed sharing for the most part has ever started from a level playing field. And I will explain to you historically in a little while why that sort of state of mind exists in Western industrialized societies. But back to old David Sackett. Listen to this quote carefully. Evidence-based, this is an article he published in the Britical Medical Journal with his colleagues. Evidence-based medicine is not cookbook medicine because it requires a bottom-up approach that integrates the best external evidence with individual clinical expertise and patient's choice. It cannot result in slavish cookbook approaches to individual patient care. External clinical evidence can inform, but never replace individual clinical expertise. And it is this expert that decides whether the external evidence applies to the individual patient at all. And if so, how it should be integrated into a clinical decision and or recommendation. Next slide. He finally says, and in a sense it's a little repetitious, but it was in the article. Similarly, I quote, any external guideline must be integrated with individual clinical expertise in deciding whether or not it matches the patient's clinical state, predicament, and preferences, and thus whether it should be applied. And I love this last statement here, he says, clinicians who fear top-down cookbooks will find the advocates of evidence-based medicine joining them to man the barricades. Next slide, please. So I wanted to point out that there has been a new recommendation put forth by one of the world's most uh, prestigious or, uh, organizations with all me uh, medical physicians involved um, called the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. And I was lucky enough to be involved in the production of this paper. It's a protocol that is used to guide pediatricians around the world, published in um, a refereed journal. <laughs> Boy, was this paper refereed. And one of the statements I want you to hear in the paper that reviews all of the SID studies and the breastfeeding studies and the connections and the non-breastfeeding populations too. Safe bed sharing is possible and the existing evidence does not support the conclusion that bed sharing among breastfeeding infants particularly causes sudden infant death syndrome in the absence of known hazards. Next slide, please. And here is some take home messages. You'll know you'll have these. You can study them later should you be interested in them. But in this very carefully done paper, it's authored by six of us from SIDS backgrounds research and developmental psychology and medicine and epidemiology, some of the top people in the world. Um, these are the sort of most hazardous factors that can be involved in bed sharing that you can take a look at. Maybe you know these already. Sharing a sofa with a sleeping adult. Infant sleeping next to an adult who is impaired by alcohol or drugs. Infant sleeping next to toddlers or children. Infant next to an adult who smokes, sleeping in the prone, that is to say, stomach, uh, face down position, sharing a chair with an adult, sleeping on a soft bed, being born preterm or low birth weight, which of course people can't do too much about. The other issue that is missing here, and that's great, uh, keep that slide, Timmy, um, is that mothers who smoked during their pregnancy 
probably should have the baby sleeping alongside on a sleep surface and not in the bed with them because it's possible that their the baby's arousal mechanisms, the, what's called the acetylcholine receptor sites, have been damaged from the the smoke that has been experienced in the gestation of the baby. In order of importance, here's elements associated with bed sharing and some general advice in the article itself. Never sleep with infants, uh, as you can imagine, we mentioned this, on a sofa, armchair, or unsuitable surface, including laying a baby on a pillow, which is not as uncommon as you might think. Place infants to sleep away from any person impaired by alcohol and drugs, which of course is common sense, but really remarkably implicated in many bed sharing deaths. Place infants always on their back, regardless of where they're sleeping. Place infants to sleep away from secondhand smoke and away from a caregiver who routinely smokes. And clothing or objects that smell of smoke, as Peter Fleming's work has showed this to be a risk. Uh, next slide, please. The bed should be away from walls and furniture to prevent wedging of the infant's head or body because beds migrate on their own and parents usually don't notice that there's a space between the wall and the, the mattress. And there's been too many babies that have um, fell between that, that space. So I've always suggested that if you really know you're gonna sleep with your baby, pull the bed apart from the frame, et cetera, and pull the mattress and box spring, if you will, to the middle of the room. Um, the bed surface should be firm, just with a crib without thick covers, duvets, dunas, pillows, or other objects that could accidentally uh, permit a head covering of some sort that could lead to asphyxiation. The infant should never be left alone on an adult bed. Um, we're recommending the adoption of the universal sleep position by mothers, especially breastfeeding mothers, called the C position or cuddle curl where they pull the moms, pull up their knee, they lie on their side, their arms are usually up above the body's head, baby is um, chest level under the mother's arm facing the mother and the mother is facing the baby. This is an image that has been found in literature and beautiful paintings of mothers and babies everywhere. My colleague, Dr. Helen Ball at Durham University was the first to really make this observation very more salient and conspicuous saying, you know, this is a position that mothers everywhere regardless of culture adopt that looks the to be the optimal safe position. Next sleep, please. Our next picture. Uh, next slide. Here it is, and it's probably familiar to many of you, and this is part of this breast sleeping concept um, that I've uh, um, coined to get away from the baggage that the notion of just bed sharing um, is all about. But anyway, it is, you can see that the mom is facing her arm is usually up. And I've seen this hundreds of times in my own uh, studies of mothers and babies sleeping together, this curving toward and the baby facing the mother. <clears throat> now I'll show you data that shows that these babies, when their mother is there breastfeeding, they just look in one direction. And that is right at their mothers as they are sleeping, etc. But it's there's a description of it, but you can take a look carefully at what that is. But many of you from having your own babies or so would likely know what this position is all about. Next slide. <clears throat> Wanted to just show you some images of it in home environment and in a famous picture by Matisse and just a picture from the 17th century. And you can go back anywhere and in any culture and society and this is what you're going to, to find. Next slide, please. I threw this in here because I didn't know where else to put it. But the question comes up, what about suffocating your baby? Well, we know in life that anything truly is possible, um, the accident, so on and so forth. But I think in our culture, we have an overblown notion how easy it is to suffocate a baby. And you hear that often in warnings against bed sharing. Um, first, I wanted to give attention to Valdez de Pina, who was one of the heroines of SIDS research, who studied thousands of babies trying to find out what happened to them. But along with many other prestigious researchers that you never hear about, um, she said a normal sleeping adult will be aroused by the struggles of an overlaying infant before suffocation occurs, unless, of course, the adult is inebriated or under the influence of drugs. But what I wanted to call your attention to is this study that no doubt would never be practiced today with institutional review boards. In fact, I'm kind of shocked it was ever done. But the study was that they put on uh, newborn babies, imagine this cellophane over their faces, over their nose and their mouth. Uh, that was one uh, part of the protocol here they were doing. And the second was stuffing 
cotton up their noses to see if these newborns could try to um, rid themselves of this obstruction. I'm just reading from the chapter that was written in 1977. In describing an experiment testing the ability of newborns to protect air passages, mouth and nares from occlusion, Rosenbluth and Anderson Huntington write of the difficulties in applying cellophane or cotton. Quote, this may require much effort and skill because of the vigor of defensive responses newborn infants make. Next slide, please. They go on to describe um, what they experienced. Um, a quote, most infants respond by opening their mouths almost at once and by pushing out with the tongue or yawning. When this proves ineffective in getting rid of the stimulus, more vigorous movements begin involving head rocking from side to side, head retractions, back arching in avoidance, and lastly, head batting at or at, batting of or at the stimulus. Frequently, mouth and head responses will occur simultaneously. Well, that's pretty dramatic, uh, at least from my standpoint. And at least it gets away from thinking that babies just are protoplasmic little blobs that lie there and just let their, their faces be suffocated. Now, granted, these would be kind of normal, healthy babies, certainly keep that in mind, but that is definitely showing that selection has favored uh, responses and rejections and re appropriate uh, behavior reflexes basically that would help babies um, at least communicate to a um, sober, uh, responsible baby in mind kind of caregiver. And I'll get back to that in a minute. Next slide, please. And back to the table in recommendations. There is insufficient evidence at this point to make recommendations on multiple bed shares um, or the position of the infant in bed. Should the baby be always on mother's side? On the dad's side, in the middle of the bed, um, each locale should consider the specific cultural circumstances and physical circumstances and conditions of the parents and what they think and want unique to its situation. Next slide, please. This is very important, a new recommendation. Conversations when a family is bed sharing should be non-judgmental and acknowledge context. Quote, Ending stigma around bed sharing and educating all parents about safe bed sharing have the potential to reduce infant deaths. Bed sharing evolved, don't forget, and I'll be showing you what this really means in a few minutes, from innate human biological and behavioral mechanism. It is not a discrete, singular, or coherent practice, as I indicated before, important point, but is composed of a diverse range of behaviors that can be independent from each other, some of which may carry risks, some are very safe, but you, of course the risk part is perhaps more important at the moment, making it particularly important to discuss bed sharing safety. Discussing the concept specifically of breast sleeping with breastfeeding parents allows a way for them to feel comfortable and discuss what they are actually doing. <laughs> and later I'll show you how many parents are really lying about what they're really doing. Okay, so here's just a few observations and a brief, brief history of an otherwise long subject that I could spend much time on of infant sleep and feeding recommendations, what they reveal, um, our brief history that is. Here's our iconic uh, Western industrialized baby, beautiful little baby with the notion to sleep like a baby. Well, the point is that this is a disarticulated baby, a baby that Niels Bergman calls in crisis because it's little genes that are telling it there's something wrong, I don't know what it is, but something is not correct. Um, and this is what we have come to think over a hundred years is the normal, beautiful way one baby should look and be in so far as nighttime behavior, but also um, the way they sleep. Here, there's no touching, there's no smells, there's no sounds, there's no uh, factory, uh, uh, signals from mother's breasts, so on and so forth. There's no engagements. It just goes on and on. There's no body heat exchange, no carbon dioxide exchanged, um, no surprise in the middle of the night that arouse babies and they start their progression of sleepover. And in some ways this could be considered the disarticulated baby. And later we'll get back to why these expressions like Winnicott pronounced years ago, there is no such thing as a baby. There is a baby in someone. How that changes the nature of sleep when that particular concept is 
um, regarded. And I will talk to that issue again, but this has a history there. Indeed, the Western science of infant sleep, your country, my country, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, the Western science of infant sleep became one and the same with the cultural values and ideology of that, of the culture that produced them. And what I mean by that is, the second point here, which is really remarkable, the original pediatric recommendations as to proper infant feeding and sleeping arrangements had never any empirical studies, no scientific studies whatsoever on babies, but rather were based on the social ideologies and values of, of four Western, I dare say, not to be picking on white influential men, but it happened to be that they were physicians, Emmett Holt, Sigmund Freud, Dave, uh, David Watson, father of American psychology and Benjamin Smock, Smock that promoted a very uh, direct, if not kind of authoritative uh, judgment on where babies need to be, should be. And in fact, that was the beginning of a road that we should never have taken. And if I do my job here today, you will at least say, well, maybe it's true. Maybe the original question should have been um, not, is it safe to sleep with your baby? But perhaps the question should always have been, um, is it safe not to sleep with your baby? Um, and next slide, please. So not surprisingly, when electrophysiology, you know, it's called polysomnography, um, when it was discovered in 1925, and it was in a primitive stage then, but it came along in the 60s and 70s, it became a little bit more sophisticated. It's a polymetric method. It isn't really just brain waves, as I'm indicating here, but it's oxygen, it's eye movement, <clears throat> chest movement, airflow. A lot of different measurements are simultaneously making it possible to interpret those brain waves and what we're really talking about here are sleep stages, the distinctions that Kleitman made between stage one, two, three, four, which sometimes are collapsed now, and rapid eye movement or REM sleep, paradoxical sleep as it's called. So it wasn't surprising, this is what I'm trying to say everyone, that um, when it came to really saying, oh my gosh, we have a chance now to scientize, to really see the science of how is it that the normal healthy baby sleeps. And of course, just like I would have at the time, I said, oh my gosh, well, let's get how babies sleep and what that would have been and what it was. And it has been up until very, very recently, all of the babies that were going to provide the evidence for how babies sleep and how they should sleep would be derived from a solitary sleeping bottle fed baby that's all wired up to provide the science. And what did it lead to? Let's take a look. Next slide. Well, now, if you can follow me, this is Took me 20 years to get this little idea. So when those physicians or psychologists decided that they were gonna take their polysomnography to the lab to study the baby, how were they actually going to study the baby? Well, they took a solitary sleeping baby and a bottle fed baby, put them in a lab and put the wires on them. And they let the little spindly little needles begin to do their, their job. So in other words, the initial test condition of baby sleeping and alone was certainly going to determine what that data looked like. And sure enough, you derive the measurements, they're in scientizing, if you will, or let me use that term. And what people did, particularly in the 70s and 80s, is they looked at babies sleeping at day one, at two weeks, at six weeks, two months, four months, eight months, and a year. Published all their works on what's healthy, normal sleep for human babies should look like. They were all published in clinical models and produced um, a, an idea of what the healthy looking sleeping human baby looks like. The problem is that it wasn't how normal, healthy sleeping babies really sleep and what they look like. But in order to replicate healthy sleeping babies, you had to, as a parent, replicate, replicate the conditions under which that data was taken or derived. So in other words, it was a very good example of first, cultural ideologies telling the doctors, where do you study healthy, normal, human infant sleep? And then we studied it scientifically and 
that data came back to reinforce the original decision on what normal healthy human sleep looks like for babies, if you can see me. It, it was a way of validating an already social value or ideology by the selection of the conditions within which this baby is being looked at. If they had looked at, as I have spent my life doing, a mother sleeping next to her baby breastfeeding through the night in very close proximity and contact, as my studies have shown, you get completely different measurements, numbers of minutes in stage one, stage two, stage three, rapid eye movement. You get credible differences in distribution of apneas and breathing cycles and heart rate and blood pressure. Every variable used in looking at infant sleep and even adult sleep for that matter, but infant and juvenile sleep is different in the social context. But here we have had a model that merged not from suggestions of who babies are and what they actually do across the species, but how in a very limited corner of the world, due to cultural ideologies and values of separation and autonomy, babies should sleep or do sleep. Next slide, please. What do we know about what parents want? How many bed chair and why do they bed chair? Um, why do they ignore and dismiss or reject unqualified prohibitions against sleeping with baby? Next slide. There's one, there's several studies, but I thought I'd call your attention to this one that looked at uh, four focus groups over, um, I think it was about 120 different parents. And I'm just gonna give you the conclusion, but you will have this reference should you like to check it out. Um, in the next slide, here are the conclusions from this study of talking to mothers themselves. Quote, parents' motivation to bed share outweighed the concerns and warnings of others. And this is completely being replicated now down in the, uh, down in the camps of millions of mothers. An understanding of parents' perspectives on bed sharing should inform counseling to promote safe sleeping practices, including safe bed sharing. Next slide. I did a study of this, uh, Hauk did, McCoy. This is a combination to quickly answer the question, why do parents co-sleep in the form of bed sharing? So we asked them to protect them, to monitor them for ease of breastfeeding. And I'm sure many of you know these uh, already, perhaps from your own children, because infants stop crying, because parents get more sleep, because it feels good. This, these are things taken right from the documents that parents provided and the careful note taking that people that called parents and were uh, eliciting information because they enjoy them, because they best attach with them, because some mothers and babies are deaf, because families fear a fire breaking out, because it's what babies need and expect. It validates maternal role from mothers that are working during the day and helps them keep their milk supply up. Um, and offers father more intimacy also with his baby at night. Uh, sometimes parents like in Los Angeles and earthquake prone areas, they sleep because they want to get to their babies quickly. And in the next slide, um, this was from my particular study, but these percentages are really very familiar wherever you take them. 93% breastfed their babies um, that were bed sharing. So there's a heavy portion of bed sharing parents, which I'll get to later in the lecture. 15.9% of the parents didn't plan to, um, an 84% meeting. They had no plan to do so at all, but did because of the way the system worked. 26% of parents said because it increased parental sleep, 9.2% improved social bonding and for emotional reasons. About 8% had reduced infant crying, 5% protection from SIDS was their explanation, I remind you. 3% uh, to, sadly to protect babies from stray bullets in at-risk areas. And then I was so amazed at people writing me detailed letters about either deaf from deaf parents and or from their babies who were deaf, um, how bed sharing was the answer to them being able to care for them in the case of deaf parents, but also reassuring babies that in fact somebody was there. Uh, very interesting thought that emerged from this paper that my friend uh, Lane Volpe and I wrote a few years ago. And who bed shares? How many? Why is it difficult to know? Well, you could probably figure out why it's difficult to know. I, um, I can, will tell you in a minute, 
the data that suggests that most parents are lying about where their baby sleeps. But I thought you'd like to see this. I did a little analysis of um, the 4 million US babies that are born each year. And then from that took the percentage of, of those babies, how many mothers uh, were leaving the hospital. Now in our country now, I know it's not as high in yours. It's about 82% mothers leaving the hospital. They don't breastfeed very long, but for about two to weeks to four weeks, and then next figure to four months, and then the six months, and some go on about 12% to um, a year of breastfeeding. But let's suppose, and these are all research papers that have um, produced percentages of breastfeeding mothers that bed share. If 72% of those mothers, which this is one study says, in our country, it means that 2,888,000 moms are sleeping with their baby, babies. If 61% of these breastfeeding moms bed share, it's 1,761,680,000 babies that are bed sharing. If 50%, which is very commonly um, found in whatever state you want to look at, about 1,444,000. And 42%, which was the lowest figure from papers looking at percentage of breastfeeding mothers bed sharing, the number would be in our country, 1,212,096. Point here simply being that even though we don't think of ourselves as a bed sharing culture, it's pretty much a bed sharing culture now. And I think it would probably be that in your country as well. Um, because there's a heck of a lot of solitary bed sharing going on for the very reasons that even for breastfeeding mothers, their babies um, are happier. They are more um, easy to settle. Um, it's emotionally, all those characteristics still hold for why mothers would, and social ideologies too, um, even in our own, own, own country and your country as well. Next slide, please. This is, these are two studies that you could look at if you care to that document in one case, 100% of the mothers knew the American Academy of Pediatric Recommendations against bed sharing and all the mothers were bed sharing 100% and knew they just didn't believe that you could not sleep with your baby. And they did. And you can read that paper published in Journal of Pediatrics. And then in Great Britain, 46% um, of new mothers when asked if they adhere to governmental sponsored versions to safe sleep, uh, no bed sharing, say they do, when in fact, they don't. And that was the determination of, of Ackman from getting it from the mothers themselves. And my own colleague, Helen Ball, would have missed originally 40% of her 250 or so mothers she studied that were routinely bed sharing simply by virtue of the way she asked the question. For example, because it's such a contested area. If parents have a crib and if in the beginning of the night, which is typical, if they put their baby in the crib, before the first feed when in fact the babies are relocated into the parent's bed. If they have that crib and they do this behavior, they say, oh yes, my baby sleeps in the crib, but they don't add that it's later relocated to another area. So anyway, there are ways, this is a hard question to get at, particularly because our countries have created a very ugly rhetoric often around it and even perhaps accusing parents of abuse and neglect. Um, and which I'm hope, trying to dispel insofar as when bed sharing, of course, is being done safely and responsibly. Next slide. But there was always one critical set of factors missing everybody and understanding the needs of infants and parents. And that is, and as I mentioned already, no one ever asked when they were trying to come up with recommendations around the turn of the century, who is the human infant as an organism, as a member of a species as a member of a particularly unique age class, a neonate and an infant. What is their biological status? What is it that babies are designed to experience and what is it their bodies can actually expect? Here's what I wanna have you look at first. At birth, this is a huge characteristic that defines much of how we how babies behave and how we should be caring for them. At birth, the human infant is the least neurologically mature primate of all and the most reliant on actual physiological regulation by the caregiver for the longest period of time. Being with your babies is not a nice social idea. It is your baby's physiology because as the next slide will show, 
throughout our evolution, which was, you know, two million years at least. Um, we transferred, transitioned from quadrupedalism as a form of locomotion to upright posture. It was a terrific adaptation because it freed our hands to manipulate things in the environment that per permitted us to make tools and it helped develop our incredible brains to be able to problem solve better than any species on the planet. You might look at this chart and what it's trying to illustrate is the number of years our babies everywhere, of course, only had one option to breastfeed and sleep next to their mothers. Um, go back a slide, not quite ready yet. Um, and you see the agricultural revolution was 10,000 years ago, the pink area. And look at the little dot that represents the industrial revolution. The point being here that our cultural innovations are very, very new, particularly separating babies from their mothers, certainly not old enough to create new sets of biological characteristics that would have babies accept and feel and their bodies respond positively to sleeping alone, which is a very recent. Next slide. Here is what happened in human evolution. We all had, you see the pelvis on the right, those are the quadrupedal pelvises. Over a number of millions of years, the pelvis changed to accommodate this upright posture with a double S-shaped sweeping of the spinal cord, a shortening, as you see there, the ischial platform, the bottom of the pelvis, the broadening of the ilium hips and movement forward as if kind of rounded, et cetera. But at the same time that we were getting bigger brains to let all this tool using and making occur, which was very adaptive, the pelvic outlet, outlet of our uh, birth canal was getting smaller and smaller. So we had a problem here. It's called the obstetrical dilemma. How do you accommodate a big brained baby basically, or at least a baby that will get a big brain, the biggest of all the primates relative to body size, um, safely born when the pelvic outlet compared with other primates whose brains are smaller um, um, is larger. So the, the accommodation was this, natural selection favored rolling back the age of the baby being born. You see the average diameter here of different primates on the top line, and you see um, human babies here with the size of the baby's skull overrunning the average dimension of the pelvic outlet. That's why human labors are so complicated, so long, and you know, so in a sense, delicate and important. The other primates, I'm not gonna oversimplify it. I'm sure a, a female ape might disagree with me, but certainly the baby's able to slip out a little bit easier than is true for humans. And that's the issue here, that we roll back the age at which the brain is developed so that we have, um, the next slide shows, encephalization is the process by which the brain got bigger at the same time that the pelvic outlet accommodate bipedalism got smaller. So our babies are born, um, in this case, I'm comparing to chimp with only 25% of its brain volume, with most of its gestation in terms of neurobiological development occurring after the baby is born. Um, and you, that makes much more important <clears throat> the microenvironment into which this baby's brain is going to experience and, and going to grow. I should add also that there's a new dimension to this. We now know that um, the, the uh, birth of the baby and contractions are stimulated by the fact that the mother's ability to supply the baby with the amount of oxygen that growing brain needs is exceeded and the baby's time to be born um, is signaled and the contraction begins, begins as well as the fact that the baby's head is now pushing against the, the cervical area of the mother's body. If you don't believe any of that in terms of associations between that and the need for babies for contact and um, for such things as nighttime care and co-sleeping. Mother's milk is sculpted perfectly and exquisitely for the kind of intestinal system that our babies have, which is all undeveloped. There isn't probably a system in the baby's body that is completely mature, including respiration, including digestion, as of course we are born without teeth um, and we have a prolonged period of development before we become adolescent and ready to reproduce. But the point here is that species that whose babies are um, able to digest um, high molecules, big molecules of fat and protein, 
their mothers are able to go off and leave them hidden in the bushes for a while while they go off and get the kind of food they need to produce the high fat and protein to begin with. But their babies are hidden in the brush or in burrows or under trees or in trees, et cetera. And there's long intervals between the feeds. But during the absence of the mother, along with this high fat kind of milk that these feed and leave moms um, actually make, is the fact that when mother is gone, those babies do not utter a cry nor do they defecate because if they did it, they'd attract a predator and that would be it. So the mother, when she comes back, she licks the perineal region of her baby. It stimulates the sphincter muscle. The fecal material is emptied and mom and baby happily go off and find another nesting site. Now our babies, our babies cry like crazy when mother isn't there because that's their signal um, that to, to try to retrieve the caregiver. And their adaptation is to retrieve that caregiver as soon as possible because it needs to be fed, of course, every two hours or so. And not only that, of course, mothers or babies defecate anytime they want. And that's not an issue for them because their mothers are always going to be carrying them and being with them, at least if not the mothers, a substitute caregiver. It's what we call in anthropology, the ala mother. And ala mothering was one of the key to our survival. The, the, empathy that goes along with caring to love another baby, another child, another mother's and father's baby, that we fall in love with just about anything and anybody. And that's our evolutionary heritage too. And then here's just an example. These are not primitive folks half evolved. These are normative modern humans that illustrate, you know, in a more vivid way um, that babies will go and be integrated into the activities of mothers. Now, obviously we live in urban industrial society, so accommodations have to made, be made for these kinds of behaviors given our economies. But when we're talking about who's the baby and what do babies need, these are the kinds of behaviors that we get the most dramatic clues as to what it is that their bodies are expecting to experience. And we get obviously co-sleep and carrying behavior all over the world. And it is as indicated here with our, our um, apes. Apes also have incredibly prolonged childhoods. They carry their babies, you know, for at least a year, maybe longer. Sometimes the mothers will hope carry their babies on their backs. Obviously there's almost continuous contact. This is our primate legacy that it helps explain this enduring um, contact seeking set of um, behaviors that our babies exhibit. They don't know why they're contact seeking, why they need to feel their mother's bodies. It's their genes finding utter expression. And they're the closest to their genes that they will ever be because their brains are so undeveloped. You know, it's really their living by way of genetic expression. So what does this contact actually do? To, I men, mentioned to you earlier, it's not just a nice social idea, but critical to infantile physiological regulation. So let's take a look at that. What does contact do? First, we discovered that it isn't even us, our species for which that critical physical uh, regulation is needed. This little macaque monkey was separated just for three days and became anaclytically depressed. And about 30% of these monkeys would die because their um, antibodies would decline to catch cold and they would die. But this is a phenomenon defined in humans as well. When babies or children at about eight or nine or 10 months lose their only attachment figure, they, they go through this hyperactivity looking for the lost caregiver. They, they give up eventually. They retire to themselves, curl up as a ball, self-stimulate. Um, and then they may or may not, in a sense, require or um, develop and uh, acquire the normative behaviors that they need to be independent from that experience, regardless of who becomes the substitute attachment figure. We know that if babies are massaged, um, uh, Tiffany Fields' work was really remarkable. She massaged babies for 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes every day and found that they put on weight uh, each day, 47%, on average, 47% more weight was gained by the babies that were massaged. And the thinking was that the touch and the prolonged 
um, exposure to the parental skin or whoever skin it was, stimulated the ner nervous, the vagus nerve to stimulate the gastrointestinal tract that made it more fluid and softer to absorb calories. And in addition, when babies are in contact, there's endorphins flowing and there's less cortisol being produced by the HBX, the uh, hypo um, pituitary axis. We know from the 1980s, we moved from Harlow, you guys probably all know about Harlow, where they found that, hmm, it isn't really the milk that has the baby attach or feel secure. This is a monkey we're talking about, but it is the soft, cuddly, uh, uh, soft towel that wrapped around a non-feeding substitute steel mother that the baby really attached to. These are, these are monkeys, I'm not explaining that very well, but the choice that the monkey had was, do you get the bottle um, with the little uh, bottle sticking out of this uh, surrogate uh, steel mother with no soft exposure? Or do you just get the soft exposure with the towel wrapped around this sort of strange steel, uh, quote, mother substitute? And all the monkeys preferred the soft contact, the alleged security, um, rather than the milk. So it kind of violated Freud's theory of uh, satiation being the process by which babies fall in love and, and come to be attached with their caregivers. So we have a huge array of papers, even in the non-human primates, that a three-hour separation, an hour separation, a three-day separation in monkeys and apes caused these particular physiological declines, as you see here, all kinds of fundamental physiological uh, uh, systems are affected by the lack of physical contact, not just in human babies, but in non-human primates too. Next slide. And here, this is one of the best uh, uh, recent studies on the effects of kangaroo care. Many of you know skin-to-skin -skin contact. Let me just read the ultimate findings here, um, 100, based on 124 babies. Uh, compared with control groups, 36 lower mortality rates among the uh, kangaroo that cared skin-to-skin uh, -skin babies, decreased risk of neonatal sepsis, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and hospital readmission, and increased exclusive breastfeeding for babies that got that extra contact. Next slide. Newborns receiving kangaroo maternal care had lower respiratory rates, meaning they were more relaxed and pain measures, main pain reactions to pain, and higher oxygen saturation levels, higher temperatures, and head circumference growth. Next slide. Evelyn Toman did his marvelous study on babies that had serious apneas. They decided to put a breathing teddy bear next to the babies that were having apneas of 40 seconds or more. And the each teddy bear was set for a particular baby's best breathing. And they put these breathing teddy bears, they had air pumps in their torsos, so it would go up and down and make this little noise. And Toman found that the babies not only gravitated to be able to feel those babies' chests rising and falling, or those teddy bears' chests rising and falling, um, um, but their apneas declined on average every single baby by about 60%. So the babies were referencing and were pre-sensitized to the expectation that something out there in their new environment, once born, would be kind of, you could argue, reminding them to breathe or being a reference to their more consistent breathing. And indeed, who is the teddy bear? Well, of course, the teddy bear is mom. I show you this slide here, not to be dramatic and to be a true anthropologist because we're interested in not just Western industrial babies, but all babies, to really make a really kind of nice point about this brief moment in time of our species where there is in fact a universal human being. Each of those babies have the accoutrements of their own culture, but they're still human babies, every one of them. Even the mother in the hospital with her baby on her chest in, in Great Britain, that's the courtesy of Dr. Helen Ball. I want you to think that every one of those babies, if they were put on a ventrum, uh, anybody's ventrum, any mother, anywhere in the world, each one of those babies would respond in exactly the same way. Their bodies would change exactly in the same way. Their breathing, their heart rate, their temperature, their cortisol levels, 
their ability to breastfeed, uh, greater number of feeds when in contact as opposed to sleeping somewhere separately or being separately. So yes, culture has different accoutrements. They look different, they have different practices, but that is the closest any of us will come to being a universal um, human being without culturalization occurring, without knowing what's normal or what to expect. It's the ultimate biological honesty to see those babies diversely born around the world, but all responding in the same way to maternal content. Now, sometimes people like to study this, which I, in a sense, got very interested in after the birth of my own son and reading all the books, my wife and I thought, hmm, boy, this certainly doesn't accord to all of the things I've been learning in anthropology, both cultural anthropology and my own studies of monkeys and apes. How could separating babies and putting them down the hall possibly be good for them? So I decided I had to learn a new skill. And this is even after my tenure, I went back to school kind of and learned neurobiology because all the research on SIDS was being done in the brain. And I suspected that that's what was causing our babies to have this alleged mysterious killer where non-industrial cultures have never even heard of it. And indeed, I started looking, I knew how you could test this by looking scientifically using polysomnography, but using a different site to get the data. And my site was, um, I created a mother baby sleep lab at Notre Dame, and I could study all the mothers and babies I wanted sleeping together and apart over consecutive nights. And we did these studies of three nights in a row, alternating between bed sharing and solitary sleeping with all exclusively breastfeeding mothers that I wanted to get as close to the normative way babies would be living. And then when you separated them, what would happen? And huge differences would take place. And I'm, I'm not going to read these to you right now, but lighter sleep rather than deep sleep, more arousals, two to three times more breastfeeding, increased wake wakings, but briefer than when babies wake, when they're alone, so on and so forth. Now come back to this, but I wanted to show you a picture of what our apparatus looked like. First, skin temperature. This was a study done in Sweden that was very supportive of our, our own studies in the sleep lab. And it was that if you took a baby, put it in an incubator and tried to make that environment absolutely just like mothers in terms of smells, uh, movement, everything, still without mother's ventrum, the babies lost a temperature. Um, when you put the babies on mother's belly, the temperature rose, not unexpectedly because that's a sharing of heat, but it's really interesting. What number would you say is normal for the human neonate after it's born? Well, I would say it's the top figure there, the warmer temperature. But what's interesting to show you how important your assumptions are and your context, my friends would always say to me in SIDS research, but Jim, aren't you worried about the uh, higher temperature of babies that are co-sleeping on their mothers or with their mothers? Say, oh no, I'm not. I'm worried about the subnormal babies that are sleeping with a degree that's less than what it should be. What would make me say that and they would say the other? Because again, it's a decision that you make about well, what is the normative evolved pattern of human babies. And that would be the place to go to get what is more close to what is such a thing as normal. Um, so I hope that you, you could understand what I was saying there. And that I would say I, the, the, the higher temperature would what one should expect in babies, not the lower. Yes, here, breast sleeping doubles or triples the night, nightly number of breastfeeds for our breastfeeding mothers. The shock was we did our first study at UC Irvine School of Medicine, and we did not expect big differences if you separated a breastfeeding pair in the second night that routinely bed share, or the routinely solitary sleeping mothers who did exclusively breastfeed. We did not expect to see much differences in the number of breastfeeds, but it was huge as you're looking at this chart here. The routinely bed sharing mother baby pairs on their bed sharing night exhibited anywhere from two to 12 breastfeeds as you see this darker shaded. Uh, this was one of our first studies. And look at the next chart, the, the dotted one. This is, that was the routine solitary sleeping but exclusively breastfeeding mothers. 
And we never expected a drop in the number of breastfeeds just because the baby was sleeping around the corner, but it was. Now this slide, I'll re help you read it. Look at the red and look at the blue. That's the first step. You notice that the blue goes all up higher. All these, in this histogram, all these irrespective of color, the yellow is data that we really weren't sure what to make of because the breastfeeding episodes were scattered throughout. We couldn't tell one from the other. So I'm really just calling your attention here. These, each one of these represents a baby, one baby, another baby, number three is a third baby, so on and so forth. And the red are solitary sleeping, but exclusively breastfeeding um, babies. That's the number of feeds they had. This baby had two, this baby had, uh, looks like five. Um, this baby had, um, let's see, oh, I'm sorry, I don't hear. This baby has four feeds. I'm just skipping here. This baby has four, so on and so forth. Notice that these are exclusively breastfeeding babies, but they're sleeping separately from their babies. The blue are the bed sharing mothers with their bed sharing babies, all exclusively breastfeeding. And look at the increase in the number of breastfeeds. Look at this number 22 baby. Boy, he was a happy camper. He got about 12 feeds. And number 25 baby got about, oh, oh I guess that's about five. And this baby here got about seven. This baby here got nine. But you can see, and what happened, which was so interesting, on the nights that we had them all do an experiment, on one night, they did the opposite of what they typically did. The bed sharing babies slept separate from their babies and the routinely uh, solitary sleeping breastfeeding mothers slept in the bed with their babies. What was fascinating is when they did the opposite, what you would have predicted from that other result um, would, would happen. The breastfeeding moms, numbers of breastfeeds went down and the solitary sleeping breastfeeding mothers, numbers of breastfeeds went up, but not as high as the routinely breastfeeding bed sharing babies, but they moved all in the right direction insofar as what those numbers were telling us. And here, just quickly, this is routine bed sharing baby on a bed sharing night. This is a routine solitary sleeping baby on their normal solitary night. And again, you see here that the babies are getting more feeds. This was about the third study we did, a little study. Two babies had three feeds, two babies had four feeds, two babies had five feed, two babies had um, two feeds. Um, one baby had nine feeds here, if you could see. A lot of babies, happy camper. And these are the solitary sleeping babies. And you can see that fewer babies, um, more babies had fewer feeds. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to make. And that even the proximity among breastfeeding mothers would made a big difference. And that means they have different intervals. Here we have the interval between feeds, right? Mean interval between feeds in minutes. The blue line um, represents routine solitary sleeping babies. On the normal night in the lab, the interval was 100, um, sorry, the normal night for these babies in the lab on their solitary night down here was 179 minutes. But when they slept with their mothers, the, the, solitary, the interval was 117 minutes. Now the routinely bed sharing babies on their bed sharing night, so this is their normal night, was about 97 minutes. And when they separated, still that interval was smaller when they were on their solitary night, it was 140 minutes. But this figure is very interesting, you guys, because the average night of their sleep, the average length of a sleep cycle for a human being is about between 90 and 96 minutes. And isn't it interesting that the feed that we found, the interval between the feeds in our co-sleeping mothers was about 90, as you see here, close to what the human sleep cycle is. It isn't particularly preposterous to hypothesize that the sleep cycle of a human being is designed to accommodate the satiation and the hunger needs of their, our babies. So that mother's normal sleep cycle wakes up at about the length of time that her baby would need a feed. So that was a little hypothesis that we put forth and we think that that's gonna be a testable idea. 
Is it important, all this breastfeeding increases? Well, certainly this is a, a, a statistic I will argue here that's a little different than what I've been telling you that is looking at formula fed babies versus babies that are breastfed. But listen to this statistic. This is really kind of amazing. Breastfed infants are 80% less likely to die before age one year than those who never breastfed, even controlling for low birth weight. And another way to think of this is for every 100 deaths in the formula fed group, there were 20 deaths in the breastfed group. Using breastfeeding as the normative behavior, 20 deaths in the first year, the formula group with 100 deaths had five times as many deaths or a 500% increase in mortality. That seems like that could be a very convincing way to, to help mothers decide that if they can, if they have the resources to, that breastfeeding their baby even a tiny bit would be better. This, I just wanted you to look at where babies are looking all night and what how they're oriented in bed to show you how regulatory mother's presence really is. When babies, no matter if they were routine bed chairs or routinely solitary sleeping babies, when they're in bed with their babies, the, 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 these big old histograms, almost 100%, they're looking at their mothers. They don't care about anything else. They're just looking in the direction of mom. But then you had to ask as a scientist, but maybe they just look that way no matter what, you know, they've got a sore neck or they just in that direction. So we looked at our babies and looked at where they were looking. A very simple idea here. Were the babies looking right? Were they looking left? Were they looking up at the ceiling when they were sleeping alone? And you see all you need to do, you don't need the percentages of the night, but you see how varied all this is. So certainly it's not comparable in both groups to the babies looking all night practically at their, their, um, their mothers, et cetera, as opposed to left, right, and up when they, these same babies were sleeping alone. So I was able to say, well, yes, that where they're looking, how they're orienting their bodies, babies, is yet another hidden regulatory factor that changes the baby's behavior when the mother is in fact breastfeeding. Next slide. This is one of our most significant findings. Babies aren't supposed to sleep in deep sleep until they're ready for it. Many have arousal difficulties of getting awake to terminate apneas, which becomes their job alone after about a month. For the first month of life, babies reflexively, the brain stem, the reticular formation will take care of the apneas. They make the baby wake up to terminate the apneas. But around one month to two months, the cortex becomes involved in breathing control. That's why we can speak. We have two systems of breathing. One, voluntary, like what I'm doing now. Second, vegetative, tidal, like what you're doing right now, this relaxing, not thinking about breathing. So I'm just trying to indicate that because of language, we have a very different way of breathing. Um, could you go back, Timmy, to that? Because I just wanted to emphasize it. When babies are sleeping alone, they spend... Um, a huge amount of time in deep sleep for which they may not be prepared. And I'm arguing in all my research papers, in this case in sleep, that this could be a risk factor for SIDS promoting deep sleep before babies are ready for it when they're sleeping alone. Look at both groups of routine bed chairs and routine solitary sleepings. On the bed chair night, the average duration of stage three, four, the stages of sleep from which it's the most difficult for babies to get out of, to terminate apneas, it is only between about seven minutes and 11 minutes. And when you put them alone, it goes anywhere between about six, uh, maybe that's 14 and a half minutes to 15 minutes. That's a big significant difference. You don't want babies that are born with arousal deficiencies being pushed to sleep in stages of sleep for which they're not yet prepared or even uh, more so. They're, they have a deficiency in that skill to be able to get awake. And don't forget that the body has to learn, the baby's body learns that it's no longer in control. I mean, I'm sorry, that the autonomic system, it's not thinking this, of course, is not going to take care of the apnea. They have to literally wake up, open their eyes, and <clears throat> break the, tap, the apnea at a certain age. So help with the mother in proximity and streams of references to the breathing teddy pair idea is really important. Here is another example of our study really providing some really important information. 
it's always a question. Will mom wake up when something happens to her baby? Well, I can sure tell you from all the studies, they certainly do. 60% of all mother's awakenings, small or large, are explained by the infant having aroused first within plus or minus two seconds. That's a really important statistic, the sensitivity of the mother to the baby and what it's doing. But the baby, likewise, is very sensitive to what mother is doing. This is a paper that was published in uh, pediatrics. 40% of all infant arousals during bed sharing are explained by the mother having aroused within plus or minus two seconds. So these are individuals that are really being affected in, uh, by every variable by virtue of the presence of the other. And that's why there is no such thing as a baby. There has to be a baby in someone. Here are the polysomnographic reportings. Just wanted to give you a visual picture of it. We're looking at um, here, eye movement and uh, breathing patterns, heart rate. We're looking at brain wave activity to determine what stage of sleep both the mother and the baby in, is in. This is the only study on the planet that has looked simultaneously of mother's physiological systems simultaneously with her infant's um, physiological system. Look at the apneas. Even the baby and mothers, when they hold their breath for two seconds, like we all do at a noise or something in the environment, mothers and babies would mimic short two second, three second little pauses. And I'm trying to indicate to you how integrated and transactional the relationship really is in a physical way. And that is normative human behavior. And I was interested also in, oh, I see there's a little runoff there, in the amount of time that mothers and babies, while bed sharing, are doing exactly the same thing. And what I mean by that, are they awake together? Are they stage one, two together? Are they stage three, four together? Are they at rapid eye movement sleep? And what I learned, if you look at this figure, is that about 42% um, of the time, a mother and baby that are bed sharing are doing exactly the same thing at the same time. That kind of is the compilation of this, this in integration of all these variables I've been uh, talking to you about. That mom wakes up baby and baby gets into the same sleep stage or she's it's awake for a moment with the mother. Um, or mom coughs and baby moves from stage uh, three to stage two, goes down to stage two. So they're regulating each other. And similarly, when the baby might make a chortle sound or cough or some mom wakes up, pulls out of stage four, goes back to stage two or stage one. And so you get this interesting normative by movements, by sounds, by smells even of the mom and baby having this synchronous kind of sleep. And I figured about 12 to 18 percent of what the mother or baby are doing is dependent on what the other partner is doing. And I call those partner induced arousals that kind of move toward this synchronicity. What is all this leading to? Tammy, you're doing such a great job in keeping this old blabbermouth going here. I really like it. <laughs> anyway, thank you for that. The dyad is the unit of study. I hope you're getting a sense of. And this is what's so hard for scientists in our culture to realize because our scientific method mostly works. Pull it all apart, look at the intimate small parts first and then put it together and see how the things gradually function together. But when it comes to mothers and babies, you gotta start with the dyad. You're not gonna understand infant digestion or vision or um, body temperature or heart rate or blood pressure or respiration unless you look at the dyad because the mother is regulating that baby's physiology every second. And that baby is regulating mother's physiology every second. That led me to make these observations, putting all this together to look at the relationship here that I was really interested in because breastfeeding is protective of SIDS. I probably should have mentioned that to you. Um, breastfeeding mothers, uh, babies have a 50% higher survival rate alone. And that's just a, without considering the other good things that can be taking place. But anyway, I, in a paper in pediatrics, it was my, I think my first data paper that I actually published, I argued that bed sharing and breastfeeding were interrelated. And this is why I coined this term just recently that, gosh, there is no such thing as maternal sleep uh, patterns, no such thing as infant sleep pattern without reference to what the baby's doing for the mother and what the 
um, infant is doing, uh, uh, sorry, mother for the baby and the baby for the mother, that they are so mutually reinforcing and integrated that you don't understand even mom's breast milk production or breastfeeding frequency or her likelihood that she will breastfeed nine months down the line. That's all affected by how much contact that mom has with that baby, usually in the first week or two of life. I didn't give you that paper, but that's certainly been shown dramatically and overly that the earlier the contact, the more likely the mother exclusively breastfeeds and does so for a longer period of months in the first year of life. So here is this concept that I propose to try to get us out of the weeds in uh, thinking that any and all bed sharing is bad. First, you have to start with the default knowledge that under normal healthy conditions, the expectation, the biology of the infant is designed regardless of whether it breastfeeds or not to be next to its caregiver to receive this array of sensory stimulation that baby needs it. It's in a micro environment that would ordinarily provide it if culture hadn't gotten in there and changed the way babies experience or could experience the first part of their life. So breast sleeping refers to breastfeeding mothers sleeping alongside their babies in relationship to her infant, either on the same surface or separate surface co-sleeping. That's the beauty of this, um, because the way nighttime contact and proximity changes infant and maternal behavior, I, I won't go through all of that because I just did, but every single variable important to traditional ways we measure and calibrate uh, sleep progression and sleep duration and just simply sleep architecture is dependent on the environment in which the measurements are taken. And we know without any contestation that the baby's normative default position in terms of our biology and evolution is always next to the mother for this physiological regulation. So I published this paper just in 2016 that kind of collected all of the things I'd been learning and my colleagues for many years and proposed to escape the debate, which never should have been debate, that let's look at the nature and the conditions and the circumstances following, following evidence-based medicine as Sackett recommended and integrating the different sciences as to what they can tell us about the best possible care for our babies. Here I have, and you can look at these things, the pro, the, the, what justifies breast sleeping as an epidemiological uh, unique category are the differences when the breastfeeding and the breast milk are experienced. Now, years ago, lactation scientists, lactation supporters, et cetera, and uh, lactation consultants realized that they're, while integrated, there are two systems that derive or that give babies benefits from which benefits derive for babies. There's the actual breast milk that we could go on forever on in terms of its benefits, but it's the delivery system, the delivery system, the proximity, the regulation of mother's body with the baby, the only environment to which the baby is adapted, the only environment to which a baby is adapted. And when I showed you that rather exotic anthropology slide of multiple babies, you might've noticed that the the bottom of the slide, it said, nothing about what babies can or cannot do can be explained without reference to the mother's body. And that is because it is the only micro environment, that is the only part of the environment to which the baby is truly adapted. And you give it that body and that baby's genes know just what to do with it. And that brought in that point about, wow, there's this small little measure of time in which human babies all over the world, even despite their genetic personality differences, which of course are to be recognized, but their bodies will do exactly the same thing. And I think that's really a kind of a really incredible point to remember. Next slide, please. But what about dads? I'm gonna skip through this. I'm sure I'm running out of time. I wanted you to know that just in recent, we've got to have discovered a paternal biology. I was involved in a study looking at Filipino dads that all basically most sleep with their, their dads. And what we've discovered, my colleague, Dr. Gettler, who is a specialist in dad physiology and relationship to childcare, et cetera, and co-sleeping, he was my student at Notre Dame. We had a big sample, 899 men. Next slide, please. 
And what we discovered, well, this is Ruth Feldman, excuse me here. She showed that as men go through the pregnancy of their wives, their oxytocin levels, the hormone of love, but it's, it's what underlies friendship and good feelings toward people we love, that the males practically follow their pregnant wives in terms of their oxytocin production. And that's yet again, a reflection of the, a special evolved paternal uh, biological basis. And in the next slide is our study that we did. It looked at looking at testosterone by saliva samples of a huge sample of men published in PLOS One. And you see that solitary sleeping men, fathers, have this amount, I won't go through the, this is PM testosterone per some liter, liter of saliva, 106.1 versus when they're room sharing, not with the baby physically, about 98 drop, this is drops or declines in testosterone. And then when the baby's on the same surface in the bed with the baby, the greatest drop occurs. Why is that significant? Because testosterone mediates mood. It mediates such things as patience and risk-taking, et cetera. So the dads that are gonna have babies because of their own involvement that would be more likely to survive would probably have testosterone levels reflecting the various reproductive status that the males are in. Similarly here, we looked at do partnering and fatherhood cause testosterone to decline? And indeed it does, as you could see here. This is morning and night testosterone. Let's suppose that um, there's no partnering with a woman or there's no children. Um, uh, you see that the do partnering and fatherhood, sorry. Um, you see that if you have neither, there is, these are the figures that you would, your baseline figures. If you're newly, could I go back on that, Tammy, I'll just for a minute. If you see a newly partnered, that is a man with a woman, you see that from here, um, there is a decline in the testosterone. And with a newborn baby, it goes down even further. Monkeys and apes do not have this that happens. This does not happen. So this is a unique human part of our evolution that males have a paternal role, an actual paternal role in being with caring for um, our very, very vulnerable, very energetically expensive babies. Next slide. And here, the longer, this is a simple paper we published as well, that T is lower among fathers providing childcare. But interestingly, it doesn't cause it. We can, this is a longitudinal study, so we know what um, the testosterones were in these males before they were child killed. You couldn't predict who was gonna be the, the father that would spend more time, but once he was with their babies, the more the time, the lower, the testosterone, the number of hours increased as you can compare this group to this. Now these papers are, I know I'm going through this fast, but I really wanted to just call your attention to the fact that fathers have a male paternal biology, just like women have a maternal biology. And that is specific to our species and evolved. So finally, in this last little section, I wanted you to be aware, I know of the complexities of the world. And one of the big questions facing us is, well, what does a safe infant sleep look like? And how do we know? Well, I hope that you'll keep all of this material in mind. I know it's there and others have done similar kinds of work. I would argue that this is not a safe environment for a baby. At very least, this picture should have had a active caregiver sleeping next to this crib. Then it would have been a safe picture to show parents. This was from an NICHD uh, uh, safe sleep site. This is not a safe picture for a baby. That baby needs to be close to the other. This, depending on how it's done, is a baby in its glory. The sensory engagements going on right now between that mother and baby, air passing, air hitting the baby's cheeks, heat, smells of mother's breasts, mom's chest movement, the touching of the baby's hand on the mother's um, face, the pantsian cells of that little hand are stimulating that part of the brain. This baby is responding to physiological system of this mother, even though it looks like this passive little thing, this baby is in receiving an array of brain building sensory stimulation that is critical to its optimal neurological development compared with 
to put it in an extreme comparison, the baby sleeping down the hall in the first year of life as soon as possible due to cultural reasons. This will surprise you. This is my colleague, uh, Sarah blacker hurdy's written some amazing books on mothers and others, uh, a brilliant biological anthropologist. Her baby born many years ago, but I loved the photo and wanted to show you. This is probably a 45 million year old picture that documents this position. That's when primates were becoming more advanced 45 million years ago and carrying their babies everywhere, sleeping with their babies. So this is prone, right? But it isn't the prone that's the risk factor. Sorry, I had my hand on the mic. This is not the prone sleep that is a risk factor. The only danger to this would be that would be one would be cautious of is the baby potentially slipping off the body of the, of the mother and being rolled over. So there is, there is that added uh, factor that one needs to be careful of. But the point is, regardless of the, that position, the question before us is, can human defining trait sets, the ones that I've talked to you with about today, instinctual traits, grabbing your baby in the middle of the night, responding to your baby in the middle of the night, you do it without thinking. And as Maya Angelou's mother once said, if you're for the right things, you do it without thinking. She said it in the novel, I Know Why the Caged, Word Sing, the, the caged Bird Sings, when Maya was afraid she might crush her baby and her mother said, when you're for the right things, you do it without thinking. It's a beautiful passage about co-sleeping and, and bed sharing without meaning to be. But then even I'm just saying that who, when you really think about it, who would want to change something as sacrosanct, fundamental to human existence and our evolution that goes back so far of babies sleeping around and near their mothers? It's probably where we don't know that information is where it might sound sensible and concomitant with other aspects of our long history of autonomy and separation thinking to be important. But I want you to know that these are the things that we have to be careful of, babies sleeping. You could see that little cute baby in the middle sleeping on pillows and all these fluffy blankets around, not a safe environment. That would be obvious to us, but not maybe to many parents. Next slide, please. I wanted to show you one other slide. This is a, a dad. You might look carefully and see the dad's elbow. He's holding himself on the bed as the mother's holding the baby. Now that is an unsafe sleep environment for a baby actually being so small as that, way too small. Next slide. And then just showing you a panorama of life. This is life here. Keep you can keep going, Tammy, here. These are just pictures I wanted people to see that we could use to talk about where is it that parents are making perhaps the biggest mistakes with their babies, what are going to happen anyway, how do we deal with them? But I wanted you to know that in our research, we certainly have looked at what actually happens at home. And you learn that life is messy and it's always going to be with babies are, if anything, very, very resilient. And parents are very mindful and will be mindful if given the chance and given the education about babies. And you can ignore this slide because we've already done that. Um, so I leave you with this, this image. I could go around and say, oh, that doesn't look ideal to me. Oh, oh, I don't like that either. Or I don't like that. But I think that we have to educate, educate, educate. Talk as I've tried to talk to you today and given you some ideas about perhaps what you can share with parents and know that they're going to be doing things that you may not like, but you can give them a foundation piece on which to build and hopefully to be as safe as they possibly can. So I'm pretty sure my time is up, Tammy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the presentation. I'm trying to run through the rest. Um, like Dr. Makina said, um, he provided the slides, so I would email that out um, after this webinar. Also, we would have the recording available on our website for those who are maybe interested in going back to it. But can you please respond to a few questions that we have here on the question and answer box so that people that are watching the video later can uh, have access to that? Sure. Okay. Oh, can you, you see the Q&A or should I read them out? 
Oh, yeah, I got you. Do you want to read them, Tammy? Okay. I got, I can them up, but, okay, so the first question says the adult's bed should not have a pillow or warm blanket. Like, that's a question. Like, they shouldn't. I think the person is just reinforcing that. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you obviously don't need as warm an environment as you might need if the baby was sleeping alone. There's no doubt about that. Um, certainly you're not gonna be measuring the heat, whatever, but light blankets, anything that would be covering the baby, um, you would wanna construct that um, bed environment to be relatively cool because the baby will have the benefit. And that's what it could be thought of as by the radiation of your own body's heat. Um, so, Indeed, and sometimes uh, just putting a baby in a halo uh, sleep suit is adequate so the baby doesn't even really have to be in that blanket that the, the parent is in. I've seen that done very well and very safely by parents. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question is, is this position to feed or stay this way in bed for the night? I think the person was referring to the C coil position. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's variable. That's a really good point to raise. Mothers don't stay in the same position all night. They come back to it, they come back to it, they come back to what I've seen, and they usually will stretch out. So you're totally right. I don't think any of us would actually stay exactly in that position. But what's so interesting, even without instruction, women around the world will adopt it. And certainly when the baby is breastfeeding through the night, again, it kind of just draws that particular position because you, for one thing, that the, the supine position is necessary. You can't put a baby prone and it's breastfeeding. You just can't breastfeed like that. So automatically the baby is going to be put down in the bed in a supine position if breastfeeding. So that's, that's kind of going to be interesting. Okay. Uh, the other one is what would you say about the stats that show that seeds is decreasing after their recommendations? Maybe that is separate or as it, as it is just to do with sleeping on the stomach, stomach rather than out of the bed? Uh, I think the person is trying to say that we know that seeds rates are decreasing uh, with the recommendations for for infants to be sleeping on a separate surface. So what would you say to that? Well, there's a whole lot of things that are changing. Just simply parents um, overall, I would say, uh, attention to the issue of safe infant sleep in a sense, regardless of where the baby is. But certainly... Um, not smoking during pregnancy. I didn't emphasize how important that really is, but a smokeless gestation, I almost think sometimes that should be number one um, risk factor for SIDS. And if you got rid of maternal smoking during pregnancy and or after, you would be eliminating a huge percentage of babies dying of what is presently called SIDS or SUDI um, itself. Um, but I do think there's that's a multi-causation of why SIDS is decreasing, which can't be separated from the fact that in most urban Western countries, the breastfeeding rates have gone really much, much higher throughout Europe. It's, it's incredibly high in certain countries, not so much in France, but even not so much in Great Britain, but in the Scandinavian countries where infant mortality is so low, in all the Asian countries where co-sleeping breastfeeding or breast sleeping is the normative pattern, since it's hardly known. So I think it's a tough question to answer simply in a, a complex society or heterogeneous society like our own. But I think it's education overall and increased breastfeeding rates, the gradual, but, but you know, it's funny, not all parents are really choosing to adopt even the prone sleep. There's a good percentage of people that still think their babies will sleep better, less uh, less likely to arouse, which is true. That's associated with prone sleep, but it also gets the issue. You don't want your baby to be sleeping too deeply without arousing, because that's not good for them. Okay. Are there findings on how long the mother is needed for the baby's regulation after birth? I'm not sure I, I know how to answer it. I mean, let's if we started with the default position, it would be a strange it would be strange for the human baby to be separated from somebody for long periods of time. Let me just begin to say that. I know that sounds kind of preposterous. We can't meet in an ideal pattern where the baby is glued to the mother or somebody all the time, but certainly, and our babies are, are certainly resilient enough to handle the intervals where they're not. Um, 
So um, what was, again, what was it exactly, Tammy? Am I, are there yes. any findings on how long the mother is needed for the baby's regulation? No. There's no formula for it. Okay. Um, anytime the baby is on you or with you, it's being regulated, etc. And the kangaroo care studies or even the studies in our own laboratory, even if the baby's not necessarily on you, but with you, that is regulatory. And you can get that by the separate surface co-sleeping too, if the baby's close enough. Okay. Okay. Can you explain the benefits of more feeds in a night? I think the person was referring to the chart where some babies had up to 12 feeds per night. Yes. yes. Well, I can, I can only tell you that early on it was discovered that uh, breastfeeding, as you know, I'm not telling anybody anything here, of course, is tremendously beneficial, but it is dose dependent too. And it's found that the more the baby breastfeeds, the more milk it gets, the, the uh, actual uh, likelihood of SIDS or an, and other childhood infant ailments declines. So it, it's just a matter, and I suppose there's a lot of intra individual variability here, uh, sensitivity to the amount of milk. So that question probably would be an interesting one to explore. Um, but it is known that it's dose dependent and that's pretty much all I can and say about it. So I think the breast milk over a period of longer time, even in the second year has its particular benefits. Um, the baby is not obviously relying on it for nutritional sustenance, but the emotional as well as getting antibodies continuously can be, can be very useful. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question here. Adult sleep cycles are about 1.5 hours, but baby sleep cycles are closer to 45 minutes. Perhaps the mother noticed when she was more awake. Mm, I think that's in reference to the sleep cycles of the mother and the infant being, being similar or something. A slide about that. Oh, this ignorance. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, processes involved here, but I can tell you that, and we looked at this, before our mothers came to the lab for two weeks, how we chose them is they kept record, um, records of what, where they were, how many times they woke up, how many times they breastfed. And interestingly, they were, when we went to the lab, they were 50% off the number of breastfeeds that they actually had. The number of awakenings was completely um, deficient of what it really was. And it was on average 50% off the number of feeds that the mother said that she had that night which is very interesting that sort of testifies to the fluidity of the process when you're sleeping close and you're not really necessarily fully waking up, but feeding your baby still. Okay. And this is a comment. It says, I find the breathing beer and the looking at the mothers very interesting. Yeah, yeah it's uh... Of course the baby's got their eyes closed, so it's not like they're obviously <laughs> staring at it, but you know, it's just this instinctual uh, attraction, I guess you could say. Um, the, yeah, it was amazing to watch those babies. You, When they were alone, they were look, moving their heads to right, up, down, but boy, they certainly weren't doing it. And so it must be a pretty old uh, kind of adaptation that the babies have. Um, maybe it's assuring that the mother is there. Maybe it's a way they're able to tell um, in their own body uh, experience, so to speak. It's not cognitive here, but very physiological, uh, reflexive. And then we have a last one. It says, this has been wonderful. I'm a postpartum doula, and I'm wondering if you have information specific to when one parent is not on board with co-sleeping. <laughs> well, it's so relational here. This is not just between the baby and the mother, but of course the family system. And I, you know what, I think the best thing that I would do, I can only give you a opinion here, there's no real answer to this other than to say that I think if parents knew what I was able to present to you today, and I realize I gave everybody a really fast dose of a huge amount of complex material really, but if fathers knew that, I think that most of the population has no idea of who the baby really is in this sense. If you began with that, rather than what to do with the baby, and that's what jumped, what happened in our history. People just jumped to what you should do with babies, you know, at night in this case, um, rather than, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
let's find out who they are first and then maybe have the discussion. So I would have to say that obviously has to be resolved within the family uh, system itself. And, um, and again, relations, there's every relationship we have is unique. There's no, and every family relationship is utterly unique. So there's why you can't give formulas out. Say, oh, mm, by the way, I see you. all you need to do to resolve that is blah, blah, blah. That's just not gonna work. So that has to be negotiated between the partners, you know, I think in that regard. But education and exposing dads to, or the other partner, whoever it may be, to who babies are. They might go, wow, I didn't know that, you know, that it really meant that much to this baby's physiology, your baby. And it might make a difference. Okay, um, let me check if we still have anything. Okay, I think that's about all. Uh, many people just saying thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, okay. Just to mention, um, I put in uh, Dr. McKenna's contact in the chat box. So if you want to email him directly, you can do that. Uh, I've also put is the link to his sleep lab, um, the website. So you can go there for more articles, FAQs, safety guidelines, PowerPoints, et cetera, if you're interested. Uh, we also have some um, resources available on our website on safe sleep. And I've put the links uh, to this um, resources, uh, feel free to uh, engage with them and download them or order them as uh, you require. So I think with that, we've come to the end of this webinar. Sorry for taking your time. Apologies for the for going uh, beyond the time that we planned. Um, any last words, Dr. McKinnon? Uh, thank you, everybody. And I'm sorry if I overstayed my visit. You know, I, I get so excited about this. It, it, it's really hard for me cutting off like that, but I know you just can't go on, but I'm, I'm thankful that you were willing to listen. And I hope that uh, maybe you guys can want to look more deeply, quietly look at the slides. You know, I know that I kind of went moved quick and I'm glad Tammy helped me do that because I wouldn't have probably got as far as I did. Um, so I am thankful for it. Very appreciative. And I know that um, what you guys do is just so critical. You're where it's at, you know, in terms of really the interface between what we can know and what we can say to parents and to help them. Um, and you know the complexity of the conditions in which they face. So it's always fitting what can be heard and what can be done. And, and I know that all of you have a huge task in front of you. And I appreciate that my work, if it can help you at all. Um, well. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Once again, I'll send out the PDF to the PDF of the slides um, and as well as a link to a webinar evaluation. Thank you and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. McKinnon. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye.